Welcome to part three of this series of podcasts on rare diseases, and more specifically, Fabry disease. As cardiac disease is the leading cause of death in Fabry patients, cardiologists are key in the diagnostic pathway. And today, we're at the UZ Leuven. Professor Obeins, hi, nice meeting you. This is Katrien van Elk. She's the host of this podcast series. Today, we're covering the relationship between Fabry disease and the heart. That's why Katrien visits Professor Thomas Robings. He's a cardiologist and has a special interest in Fabry disease. We'd like to hear from him how cardiologists can screen for Fabry disease. Professor Robbins, thank you for making time to explain why cardiologists are important and how they can speed up the diagnosis of Fabry patients. Uh, well, we know there is cardiac involvement in a vast majority of Fabry patients. What is your view on the role of the cardiologist in the diagnosis of Fabry disease? As you all know, of course, Fabry disease is a rare disease. So that means that we do not often diagnose Fabry disease, but we have to think about it. And the reason for that is that a lot of Fabry patients, about 65%, according to uh, some research, do have cardiac involvement. And also cardiac involvement is the most important important and the leading cause of death in Fabry patients. Furthermore, early diagnosis is important because uh, if you can start treatment early, this has the best results. And we know that if we start late with treatment, some patients might have a progression of their structural heart disease, even with development of advanced stages of heart failure. Um, and that is mainly in, in if you start treatment of in patients with considerable hypertrophy of the left ventricle and important fibrosis. So therefore, it's very important to have an early diagnosis of the disease. There are also many patients who have the so-called cardiac variant of the disease, where you actually only have cardiac involvement and only cardiac expression of the disease. And therefore, cardiologists are very important to make the diagnosis. And which are the most common cardiac symptoms suspicious for Fabry disease? So basically, the symptoms that Fabry patients have uh, relating to their heart are mainly the symptoms of left ventricular hypertrophy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And these can be uh, a lot. So dyspnea on exertion might be a symptom. They can have palpitations due to atrial fibrillation or other rhythm problems. They can have chest pain, for example, caused by microvascular dysfunction or even stenosis of an important artery. They can have syncope, uh, and syncope can be caused by different reasons. For example, if they have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction caused by their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they can have autonomic dysfunction. And even in the end stages of the disease, you can have a complete heart block causing syncope or uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And this might even le lead to sudden death. Okay, um, what are the most common types of Fabry patients you encounter? So basically we can divide Fabry disease patients in two cohorts, two groups. You have on the one side the classical Fabry disease, which often manifests already in childhood as a multi-system disorder where we do have neurologic involvement, renal involvement, dermatological involvement, and also cardiac involvement. However, Patients that we encounter most are the ones with the late onset cardiac variant of Fabry disease, and they manifest with left ventricular hypertrophy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and also the symptoms that I've explained to you before. Next to electrocardiogram, which techniques do you use to visualize cardiac involvement? So basically what we should do as a cardiologist is look for red flags, red flags of Fabry disease, and they're are many ways or many different red flags that can be present. Uh, as you said, you can have abnormalities on the electrocardiogram, for example, a short PR interval, um, very high voltages, negative T waves. These are all things that can be seen in left ventricular hypertrophy. But the short PR interval is rather specific for a Fabry disease. As you all know, Fabry disease most often presents with concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. However, Asymmetric ACM might also be an expression of Fabry disease. 
And there are also also some uh, specific structures that can be hypertrophic, like, for example, the right ventricle, which is uh, normally not seen in a typical sarcomeric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or papillary muscle hypertrophy is also quite specific for a Fabry disease. If you then look at more advanced imaging techniques, uh, we now have the ability to do uh, global longitudinal strain imaging uh, using transthoracic echocardiography. And if you have a reduced value of that GLS or global longitudinal strain in the posterolateral wall, this can be a sign of Fabry disease. Another imaging technique, uh, of course, is MRI, cardiac MRI. And we can see some other things there. First, you can see the fibrosis, which can be present, especially in the posterolateral uh, wall in the mid-myocardial uh, zone. And the second thing is uh, if you do T1 mapping, which is a special mapping technique which can be done on MRI, you find low values which are actually quite specific for Fabry disease and that can already be present before overt hypertrophy. So this can be a very early marker of the disease. Now from your own experience, which target group must be tested to find or diagnose Fabry patients? What, what do you recommend to your peers? From my own experience, Fabry disease can be diagnosed through different ways. So first, what we most often encounter in our own practice is that uh, we make the diagnosis through screening of a patient with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or an unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy. And what we should do in all these patients is perform genetic ACM, ACM panel testing. And that is a genetic test where we test for a multitude of genes, including the GLA gene, which is the gene that is the cause of Fabry disease. And as such, you can identify in up to 1% of unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy patients with a Fabry disease. A second way to diagnose a disease if you, uh, is if you have one of these red flags that I explained to you before. And if you have one of these red flags, you actually do not really need that cutoff of 15 millimeters of left ventricular hypertrophy. If you encounter, for example, a hypertrophy of 12 millimeters in combination with one of these red flags, I think you should already go for a diagnostic test of Fabry disease. And in a male patient, you can do the enzymatic test and test the alpha-galactosidase level. And if it's low, then this suggests the Fabry disease. If you have a female patient, you should directly go for the genetic test of the GLA gene. And the last way to uh, make the diagnosis of Fabry disease, in my opinion, is uh, if you have a Fabry patient, you should, of course, go for the family as well and uh, do what we call cascade screening, where we uh, test the family members, uh, which are based on uh, the X-linked inheritance at risk of having a Fabry disease. And I have to make a remark here that X-linked inheritance is not maybe as you uh, all think about it. So in Fabry disease, female patients can also have the disease. And that is probably due to the fact that you have lionization with uh, X skewage, where a lot of the cells contain the abnormal uh, gene in females, and this can lead to disease. However, Fabry disease in, in female patients often is less pronounced and less severe, but they can have symptoms and they should be treated if they have. And once a diagnosis is confirmed, what are the next steps then? So if you have a diagnosis of Fabry disease, uh, you, I think you you should refer your patient to a metabolic center or a cardiogenetic center where there are experts for Fabry disease, and they should decide on whether to start or not with treatment. Uh, And of course, from the cardiac point of view, these patients should be followed up regularly. Um, We do this every year and we do that to evaluate progression or possible need for treatment. I personally have a very low threshold to perform a cardiac MRI in these patients uh, to look for fibrosis and these low T1 values. And also uh, don't forget to perform halt recordings from time to time to pick up uh, any cardiac rhythm disturbances like conduction defects or uh, ventricular tachycardia. And a third point, of course, is that if you have a diagnosis, you should do family screening as we discussed before. I have a last question for you. 
Can you tell us about the diagnostic pathway of a specific patient, the collaboration with the laboratory and the metabolic center? Yeah, sure. So I do follow a 53-year-old male patient who was actually uh, picked up because of an abnormal um, ECG taken at a pre-operative uh, setting by the anesthesiologist. And this ECG suggested uh, the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy. And this was followed by, of course, a workup where we do a transthoracic echo, echocardiography. And he actually had a rather typical asymmetrical septal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a wall thickness of 24 millimeters. And this was then followed by an MRI as well, where we saw that he had extensive fibrosis in the lateral wall. And at that point in time, we did not really think about Fabry disease in the first place, because if you have an asymmetrical septal ACM, the chances are more likely that he has a sarcomeric form of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. However, as we do genetic testing in all these patients, we also did in this specific patient. And due to that genetic test, we could identify a GLA variant of unknown significance at that time. And we then went back to the patients and the laboratory, asked for an enzymatic test and could show that this specific patient had a, an undetectable value of the enzyme, suggesting that this really is a Fabry disease patient and that this GLA variant of unknown significance is not any more of unknown significance, but is really a pathogenic variant. So because of this patient had cardiac involvement, he was started on therapy. And a couple of years later, we decided that we should do more. And uh, that was based on the fact that he had a very severe fibrosis of, uh, of the left ventricle. This was not more pronounced than on the initial MRI, but at that time, uh, he also developed some heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction of 33%. And we decided that we should also prevent him from uh, sudden death with a defibrillator. And because of the fact that he also had some broader QRS interval with asynchrony, we decided to put him over to place and uh, cardiac resynchron uh, CRTD, so uh, an ICD, which is also able to do cardiac resynchronization. Of course, as I already told you, it does not stop if you make a diagnosis in, in that specific patient. You also have to go for the family and we did uh, family screening. Luckily, um, his four siblings all tested negative and uh, he did not appear to have any kids. So we were lucky there that there was only one family member diagnosed with Fabry disease. But I think this case really illustrates that a patient with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which may might look like a classical sarcomeric one, might still be a Fabry disease. And that's uh, very important in that case to do the genetic test. Or even if you have any of these red flags in a male patient, to do the enzymatic test to make a proper diagnosis and to offer uh, the right treatment for this patient. Well, Professor Robbins, thank you very much for these interesting insights. Hopefully you convinced your peers to be attentive to the symptoms of Fabry disease to diagnose patients in a timely manner. Thank you thank very you. much. If you appreciated this podcast, watch out for the next one. Then we will talk with not one, but two nephrologists. They will share their experiences on screening for Fabry disease. Thank you for listening and stay tuned.